lovely to be here in Whangarei. It's, uh, I, I was looking round, I thought, well, I won't know too many people there, but then I see some familiar faces. Good to see, good to see Jim looking fit and well uh, and uh, full of life there. And uh, good to see Luke, who's taking his last few weeks holiday, I suppose, before you head back to Avondale. And uh, I was thinking, I was just talking with um, Lou last night, and I was saying, you know, we've got three from uh, Whangarei. We've got Holly, Zian, Kaya, and what I forgot is we've actually got Luther, who's worshipped here quite a bit as well. So there really there's four that we have from uh, Whangarei down there at LAC, and delighted to have them. This year we've uh, started with about 280 in total, I wish they were all in the boarding, but no. We've got about 58, I think, was the last figure I saw in boarding. We get another 23 who come from Japan, terms three and four. So we're, we're up and ready to go. Um, Ministry of Education said towards the end of last year, you're going to have 234 students. And I thought, they do their predictions. I didn't think they were right, and I'm very pleased they're not. And there's pleasing to see that we've actually got a, at year seven, uh, the first intermediate year, we've got a big influx this year, and we've also got a big influx into year nine, or the old form three, for those of you that think in the old currency. Um, we've got quite a group there as well. So it's looking good, and I, um, yeah, we're, we're looking forward to a really good year down at LAC. And special thanks to some of you in this church who have been so supportive of some of the children that would like to come. I look in the front here, I think I should round up the first couple of pews there and put them all in a minibus and take them back down with me. But uh, often there are young people who would like to go to Longburn, but they think it's beyond them. And I like, uh, I really appreciate Gary, the way that you've taken a few people under your wing. I wish I had a Gary, I could clone him and put him in every church. That would be marvellous to have someone like that. And it just, when a young person has a dream, and they think it's really not possible, and an older, more experienced person comes along and says, oh, I think we can make this work, it's a, it's a fantastic thing. Uh, it, you know, we all like to see our dreams come true. And some of us older ones, you know, when we're able to do that for the young people of the church, it's a tremendous encouragement to them and a great witness I thought I'd, and I have to give a big thanks to Tony. Mike, my laptop wouldn't talk to the system, so I've got his. So um, I thought this morning I'd just share a little bit with you and uh, about the story of the road to Emmaus. I'm sure you all know the story. Am I right? Anyone not know it? No, we all know it. And uh, I like, uh, I, I get into my inbox every day a little thought that comes from Max Licardo. And I like what he wrote in one. He says, the Bible is not a newspaper to be skin read. It is a mine to be quarried. And digging down deep into the Bible sometimes, if we spend more and more time on a passage to try and find out what exactly was happening, I get a bit of a kick out of that. And I find that irrespective of how much I've discovered before, there's always a little bit deeper you can go down and you find out more and more. The riches in God's word is quite incredible. And so I've, I've always loved the story about the walk to Emmaus. Always one of those stories that's warmed my heart. And so I thought, well, I'll look a little bit more closely at this and see what we can find out. And uh, when the Bible writers in the New Testament wrote... They wrote out that in, in, in Greek on papyrus. And that's what, there's a fragment, a very early fragment of the New Testament. I don't know which part it is. Ken, do you remember your Greek? You could read it to us. But <laughs> I, that when they wrote, because paper wasn't plentiful and cheap like it is today, we scrawl away on a bit of paper and throw it away as though it's of absolutely no value. Uh, in those days, when those writers wrote, they had to use an economy of words, and you can see all the, all the words are crammed up, no spaces, all in capitals, and so when they wrote with this economy, they often didn't bother to tell the reader what they knew the reader already knew. 
that would waste paper or papyrus. And so often when they mentioned events and when they mentioned people, that they were writing initially, and when they mentioned these people, the reader goes, oh, I know him. I know what that story's about. But with 2,000 years now intervene, we find people mentioned, we find events mentioned, and we go, I wonder what that's about. I wonder who they were. And so we've got to often dig around until we actually find what the story really was about. And, uh, and of course, Luke was the writer, Dr. Luke. And uh, I always think Luke has a little bit of a backhander to the other uh, gospel writers, doesn't he? He says, I, I, I put together an orderly account, dear Theophilus. And I always think it was insinuating the others had put a disorderly account together. <laughs> But I like Luke because he, he was an, obviously an educated man and he was the nearest to an historian that I think of any of the gospel writers. And uh, this is a, a painting by an a English painter called Tissot and this is what he thought Luke looked like. I don't know, but Luke was educated. Luke was one of the few who probably spoke to a lot of the people that he wrote about. If you read through the story of uh, Mary when, she, when the angel comes to her and those sorts of things, and he puts in there how Mary's remembered all these things, stored them up in her heart, and it's got that ring of somebody who actually spoke to Mary, heard firsthand what had actually happened. And I can just imagine Luke's gone round and he's collected all these stories and he's decided what's going to go into his gospel. A lot of it is in common with what went into the other gospels but there's some unique features of, you, of Luke's writing, and he is the one that gives us the clearest account of the walk to Emmaus. And I like what Luke says. He says in Luke 9 there, verse 51, as the time approached for him to be taken up to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. So before we have the story of Emmaus, and before we have the story of that last week, we have Luke saying how Jesus knew that the time had come and he sets his face towards Jerusalem resolutely, knowing exactly what was going to happen to him. He knew what the, how the people would react when he arrived. He knew how he would be fated and, uh, and then he knew how they, he would be put on trial, and he knew that he was going to die. And I would say that he knew that that death was going to be one of the cruelest deaths that you, people could inflict on other people. But he still set out resolutely to do it because you can see you and me here on the 11th of February 2012 needing his forgiveness and his grace. And if we go down to the story, I'll just, just read through it, and it's, it's, a, it's a little lengthy, but I think it's well worth reading what Luke has to say. And he says there, Now, that same day, two of them were going down to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened, and as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things? He asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but they did not see Jesus. He said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. 
Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he was going farther. But they urged him strongly, Stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened and they recognised him and he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us when he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem where they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. And uh, great story, isn't it? Great story. And then it st he starts and he gets it. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus. And Emmaus is not too far from Jerusalem. It's a walk, fairly rough, windy walk. And, uh, and he tells us another thing. He says, and one of them was named Cleopas. Now this is one of the disadvantages we have. We don't know Cleopas. But I'd suggest that probably everybody that read the first gospel may have known even Cleopas personally or who he was. John mentions uh, Clopas. I think in John 19 when you read the account, a husband of one of the Marys that was one of the followers. And it's quite likely that Cleopas was actually related to Mary, the mother of Jesus. So it's quite likely that Jesus appears, and as it is, walking with one of his relatives who didn't even recognise him. So I put this in too. You might say, well, what's he put a Rembrandt in there for? But writers and artists are very... I haven't got a pointer here, but... And I don't know whether you can see, this is the Rembrandt, the, the, the Night Watch. If you go to uh, the Rijksmuseum near Amsterdam, you, you can see it. And I've been there, seen it, and it's a fantastic, huge picture. And just over on your right, you can see the guy with his hand out. And you may just see a guy behind the arm with his hat, and the eyes just peering over the arm. Well, that's Rembrandt. <laughs> he painted himself into the painting. Not unusual for painters back in the Middle Ages and earlier to do that. And it's not unusual for the writers and the writers of the New Testament too to write themselves into the story without naming themselves. John was great, wasn't he? John kept talking about the beloved disciple, never names himself. So he paints himself right throughout his gospel. Some people say that this other disciple that was with walking on the road to Emmaus was Luke. Now, I don't know. It, he may well have been. And it's probably quite likely. It's one of those questions we've got when we get to the kingdom to find out. Was Luke telling the story that he knew so well because he was there and maybe this was the spark in his life that took him to become such a a strong follower of Jesus Christ and to write the gospel that we read today. Um, Emmaus, you can see, I don't know, I haven't got a pointer, but Jerusalem is just to the, that side of the top of the Dead Sea and modern day Emmaus, which is on there, is a little bit further than what we believe Emmaus was the one that these guys were walking to. Uh, that modern day Emmaus actually dates from probably a couple of hundred years after Christ. And so there was this little village and they were walking uh, northwest after that tumultuous weekend. And Judea is not, not a big place. They're actually quite small. And uh, in those days, it may look on a map a distance, but to them it was not a long distance to walk. They were used to walking. They could walk long distances in those days. And, uh, and they were off. And what a week... These two had witnessed. 
a week that I don't think there's ever been in history a week as tumultuous, where so much has happened, and if you had been in Jerusalem that week, you would have seen and witnessed or heard about incredible things. Basically starts at Bethany, which is just out of Jerusalem. Starts with Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. And I bet they talked about that around Jerusalem. And people knew, and that word had spread, that this man Jesus has raised somebody from the dead. So the people were agog at what was happening, and they, they were... No wonder they said, are you the only one in, in Jerusalem that doesn't know? What would the younger generation say? Get real or something. <laughs> they, we, you know, it was like inconceivable that somebody was there and didn't know what was going on. So there was, started with that. Jesus had gone to Simon's house. There'd been the anointing of his feet by Mary. Uh, the, he had dined with the rich and famous there and had uh, this woman who was so grateful for, that, for the forgiveness of her sins that she had broken the, the alabaster over his feet. And Jesus was only, the only one there who realised the true symbolism that, you know, anointing his body because he knew very, very soon he was going to die. There had been the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. In the ancient world, crowds, mobs, had great power. In Rome, if you could control the mobs, you had control of the city, basically. And the crowds came out and they acclaimed this man and they believed that he's going to be the Messiah and he's coming triumphantly and he's going to drive out the Romans and it's going to be a great time. And so they acclaim him that as he comes into the city. And he goes to the temple and he drives out the money changers. Now that certainly got the attention of the high priest and his family because that was a cash cow for them. All the profits that went out of this went into the Caiaphas's coffers. And so Jesus throws out a challenge to Caiaphas and his family by driving out the money changers and saying this place should be a place of worship, not a place of commerce. And then we get to the, the Last Supper, Thursday night, isn't it? And then he, he meets with his disciples. And they still can't believe that it's going to end differently to what they believe and that there's a traitor amongst them. And he's put on trial in front of Pilate, in front of the high priest, scourged, and then led to Calvary where he's crucified and he dies there on the Friday. So if you can imagine the range of events that had happened, they had believed those guys, these two guys who are walking on the road to Emmaus, had been there early in the week and had thought, this is it. This is the beginning of the golden age. And, uh, you know, this is, the, this is the Messiah, Mashiach, as they used to call him. He's going to come and he's going to be a political leader. He's going to be a military leader. He's going to be a great judge. Those Romans will be gone. Won't have to pay the taxes to them anymore. The land will become productive. We'll be wealthy. People will live in harmony and all the nations will look up to them. That's what they thought early in the week. And by the end of the week, it's all dashed. It's all, as we now term, turn to custom. These guys go, and I can imagine... Cleopas thinking, you know, I could have been one of the uncles to the Messiah. And it's not going to happen. And there's this bitter disappointment as, he, as, he, as they walk back from the city. We all, we all have to deal with disappointment from time to time. But this is a quite little bit from Ellen White when she talks about this particular story. She says they were defeated in expectation or hope. It was all gone. And uh, I don't know about you, but I've had to deal with disappointment a number of times. I bet you have too. But probably not disappointment to the extent that these two guys, Cleopas and probably Luke, 
as they walk back to Emmaus that, that day. Um, they thought it's all finished. And then they meet this man who he joins them, who talks to them on the way as they go along. I, I would love a really good record of what he said. Because later they said, what, didn't their hearts burn within us? And they didn't realise who it was who was providing the encouragement to them as they walked towards Emmaus. But it was a hope that he supplied to them, a spark that he supplied to them that lit up in their hearts again. And I don't know what they th really expected was going to be, but they obviously this Jesus had provided hope that, no, it wasn't all dashed, it hadn't all finished, Things there still is a bright hope. You know, we do, we do the job of Christ when we actually help provide hope to other people when they're disappointed. I like this. One of my favourite quotes from Albert Schweitzer. And he says, At times our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude to those who have lighted the flame within us. And that's what Jesus did for the two disciples. He lit the flame again and gave them hope. I just put this one in this morning. <laughs> I think I know there'd be two people that recognise this man. This is Professor Richard Fall, Auckland University. He's an amazing man. He's a researcher on brain, and so we have two people here, and Morris would know this man well, I'm sure. <laughs> not only is he a brilliant brain researcher, he's world renowned he's the guy who discovered that brain cells will regenerate, so if you're fine you're forgetting things, thank Richard that there might be hope but <clears throat> more than being a brilliant researcher what I like about him is that he's a, he's a fantastic human being a warm human being and uh, if you go looking on the net for a photo of him, you cannot find a photo where he is not smiling. Every photo I've looked for, he's got a smile. And he says this, he says advice he gave to his own children. He says, when we talk to someone, they should leave us feeling better for having, having had a conversation with us. And what a great philosophy of life that is. When you talk to someone, leave them feeling better for having had a conversation with you. And these two disciples certainly felt better for having had a conversation with the person they knew not still at that stage. And then, of course, he comes into their home, and this is a painting by Caravaggio, an Italian artist. Now, when they painted, they weren't trying to portray it exactly as it was. I don't know if they had chicken with its legs still on on the table there that night. He paints Jesus clean-shaven, because Mark, I think it's Mark says in his gospel, he appeared in another form. And so Caravaggio is trying to tell us, well, he appeared and he was a little bit different to what they had expected. And you can all recognise which one is Cleopas over on the right-hand side because you can see he's got a clamshell. You all knew that, didn't you? He became what was known as the patron saint of, of pilgrims. And pilgrims would carry a clamshell, so when they went to lay claim to some flower or at somebody's house, they were allowed to take as much as they could get in a clamshell. So when the middle people in the Middle Ages looked at this, they knew the man with his arms outstretched and with a surprised look, and the older of the two was Cleopas. And I love this look of Luke sort of sitting up in his chair as Caravaggio brings that moment when they realise who has blessed the food. And the servant standing there who says, I don't even know what's going on here. And I think he's captured it brilliantly that there are times when Jesus is at work and we don't even realise that he has been at work there. And that's what happened with these two guys. Um, and I like this, but they said, they asked each other, we're not our hearts burning within us while well, we, he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us. It's immediately what they said to each other after he had disappeared. And then, of course, they ran in the dark. It was Passover weekend, full moon. They would have been able to see where they're going. 
but they didn't wait for the morning. They ran all the way back to tell the other disciples that we have met the risen Lord. He is alive. And as the Bible says, they got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. They found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true. The Lord is risen and appeared to Simon. And uh, I found this bit too. i giving you two quotes from Max Licata. He was writing about Hebrews 12 and he says, Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith who for the joy set before him endured the cross. And Mercado makes this comment, he says, Remember, heaven was not foreign to Jesus. He is the only person to live on earth after he had lived in heaven. He knew heaven before he came to earth. He knew what awaited him upon his return, and knowing what awaited him in heaven enabled him to bear the shame on earth. I think that's key to the story. And I've often thought, you know, why, why did Luke put this story in there? Because I'm sure it's not a haphazard collection of stories. And it's one that, uh, one is, well, great encouragement. And he tells the story of two travellers. And, and we are travellers. We are travellers. We're moving through this world and our destination is heaven. And just like the two travellers needed encouragement along the way and refocus, we sometimes need that encouragement and refocus as we head towards heaven. Even when we're getting close to the destination, as I believe we are now. And they were downcast and they were heading in the wrong direction. They were heading away from Jerusalem when they should have been heading back to Jerusalem or staying in Jerusalem. And he comes along at that stage when they're... You've been on a journey and you get downcast and you think, I'm not getting anywhere. And uh, the Lord knows. He knows what you're going through. And he's there, if we believe, right there beside him. Ellen White says that when those two ran back to Jerusalem, there was a third with them. They didn't realise that he was with them, travelling back to Jerusalem. And he's there with us even when it seems we're all alone and when things are tough. Jesus came, he listened and explained and made sense of things. And sometimes that's what we've got to do when life seems to be without sense, we seem to be downcast, things seem to be going wrong. We sometimes have to sit and listen and wait for the voice of God and he will make sense of what is happening when we can't. It also tells us that Jesus never imposes himself. He came, he joined them, he knew what they were going through, he was going to go on, and to their credit they said, stay, come and... Imagine if they had said, all right. (laughs) That story would never have existed. But Jesus doesn't impose himself on us. It's our choice whether we invite him to be part of our lives. And when we do invite him in, Things change and they will never be the same. The risen Lord, he can be just as real today as he was to those disciples on the road to Emmaus. And we just need to ask him. To meet the risen Lord is something that transforms our lives. And we need to ask him to come into our lives. We need to ask him that we can meet him. And he won't fail us. We will meet him. So I think when we look at why the story of the road to Emmaus, it brings great encouragement. It does to me. And there's another little thing. I think it tells me when J.B. Phillips translated the New Testament, he, he came out with this. He wrote a book entitled The Ring of Truth. And he told how as he, as he wrote down and, 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 and translated, he says, as he wrote these things, they didn't seem to him to be made up stories. They had that ring of truth to him. And I, I, like, I like that expression because to me this is a story with a ring of truth to it. And I put it to you. 
If this story is true, it alters everything. If Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, it alters everything. Everything that he said and promised, we can take heart in and follow. And this is a true story. It didn't just happen, or it wasn't just... What sort of story would you have written about uh, if you had been back in those days and were... I would have had them appearing to the high priest and a whole range of things if I was making it up. He appears to those people who love him and who need him and who want him. And it's the same today. He'll appear, he'll be with you if you need him, if you want him and if you love him. And uh, we need to ask ourselves, do we really know him? Do you really know the risen Lord? Have you invited him into your life to make a difference? And this is what he says right at the end of the New Testament, isn't it? In, in Revelation. He says this to everybody. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. Let's claim that promise. Dear Father, we thank you for the encouragement that your word brings us. We thank you for the promise that you are always there with us, even unto the end of this age. Help open our eyes to your presence and to your willingness to be with us every step of this life's journey right through to your kingdom. And help keep us faithful so that we will all be found in your kingdom when you come, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.